Hey everybody, Tactic Angel here, back on the PlayStation 4 to take another look at a premium ship in World of Warships Legends. This time we'll be reviewing the Tier 6 Italian light cruiser, the Duca degli Abruzzi. For this review, we'll start with some history, move into analysis, discuss commanders, then run down the stats with you, and finish off with a bit of gameplay. If you do want to skip around, I should have set up the chapters for this video, and you can find the time codes down in the description. The Luigi di Savoia, Duca degli Abruzzi, the full name of this ship, was the first of the fifth and final generation of Condottieri class warships. Though calling it a class is a little bit of a stretch since essentially it was a family of several relatively closely related classes of ships. Calling them a family of classes probably makes a little bit more sense since this set of ships includes the four ships modeled on the Alberto da Yoizano design, which we have in World of Warships Legends, as the tier three ship Yoizano, then the two Cordona class ships, the two Montecuculi class ships, which we also have in Legends as the tier four tech tree ship, the two ships of the Duca d'Austa class, and finally the two ships of the Duca degli Abruzzi class. These ships all had a similar purpose, but had considerably different design and technical capabilities. Though most would feature eight 152mm guns, the final two ships of the Duca degli Abruzzi class featured ten guns, with the forwardmost and rearmost turret having been swapped out for three gun turrets rather than the two gun turrets of previous designs. Similarly, the gradual progression of the Condottieri family of ships would see their displacement balloon from just 5,300 tons to more than 11,000 tons, essentially twice as massive, so probably not best to consider them just one class of ships, each ship type being a slight improvement over the last and generally making them more heavy. So the Abruzzi's in this case were 1,500 tons heavier than the Dausta's that came before it, though the addition of all this weight did slightly reduce the top speed of the Duca degli Abruzzi class of ships versus the other Condottieri type cruisers. Though there was no ship called the Condottieri, similar to ships like the English town or county class cruisers, these ships were initially named after real and fictional Condottieri from Italian history. And what is that? Well, the word Condottiero means contractor in Italian. And essentially, the condottieri were mercenary captains who had their own armies, who fought in various wars at the end of the Dark Ages through the Renaissance throughout Italy. Though, yes, essentially paid for their loyalty, their success in ensuring the liberty of various Italian city-states did make them folk heroes. And if you've ever wandered about Italy today and see a man riding a horse, there's a pretty decent chance that he's either a real or fictional condottieri. In any case, Luigi di Savoia, also known as Luigi Armidia, was not a condottieri, and is actually a relatively modern figure. Being a man born in 1873, and was a somewhat famous Italian mountain climber, explorer, and naval officer. In fact, he was even the Prince of Spain for about two weeks following his birth. The ship, named in his honor, was laid down in December 1933, launched in April 1936, and commissioned into service in December of 1937. Like all condottieri type cruisers, the Duca degli Abruzzi was designed primarily as a counter for the oversized French contre-tourpolier destroyers that were likely to be floating around the Mediterranean, though the Abruzzi class ships did sport a little more protection than her half-sisters. Still, the Abruzzi was quite fast, clocking in at more than 34 knots during trials. After her shakedown, the Abruzzi participated in blockades during the Spanish Civil War alongside Nazi Germany in support of the eventual victorious nationalist forces. At the start of World War II, the Abruzzi was part of the 8th Cruiser Squadron alongside her sister ship, the Garibaldi. Both ships participated in the Battle of Calabria in September 1940, being the spearhead of the Italian offensive. Though none of the ships gained a particular amount of glory in this engagement, as it was fought to an eventual stalemate. She was also present at the Battle of Cape Matapan a year later, in September of 1941, though she would not play a significant role in its ultimate outcome. Which was probably lucky for the Abruzzi, considering how poorly all of the Italian cruisers under Italian Vice Admiral Catania fared during that engagement. 
Namely, they were all disabled in less than five minutes, and then were all lost, including the Zara and Admiral Catania, who had made her his flagship. In November 1941, the Abruzzi was back in port and was damaged by an aerial torpedo, but she was repaired and returned to operational service in 1942. Alongside the Garibaldi, she did attempt sortie against Allied shipping in Greece with no success. After that, due to shortages in naval fuel, the two ships would find themselves a permanent fixture in the port of La Spezia. Following the Italian armistice, both ships successfully traveled to Malta, unlike the Roma, which we talked about last week, and would be in turn for the remainder of the war. Following World War II, the Abruzzi would serve Italy for another 15 years, until 1961, undergoing several modernizations during that time, before she was finally decommissioned, with the Abruzzi ultimately being sold for scrap in 1972. The Abruzzi joins a crowded field of Tier VI cruisers who have one thing in common, the very real possibility of being sent back to port very quickly for being a bit unlucky and or doing one stupid thing, which is not at all helped by how often they're going to be bottom tier where they are outclassed, pretty significantly, by their Tier Seven cruiser counterparts. Of course, ships like the Atlanta, Belfast, Boise, and Indianapolis all have something that really make them unique and at least situationally powerful. You know, it's either that they have a billion little guns, radar, or some zombie heel. The Abruzzi? Not so much, though there are things that make her different than Italian cruisers, namely that you don't have a smokescreen, but you do have sonar. The reality is that's just making you more like an average cruiser in the game. If the Abruzzi does have a trick in its corner, it's a lot more subtle, and it comes with having above average speed and really great concealment. This really ought to help you get into advantageous positions and use the Abruzzi's firepower to devastating effect, but there's really not all that much devastating about the Abruzzi's 152mm guns, which have a fairly average AP DPM, though you'll find yourself bouncing off of just about anything that shows you an angle, but then it does have really awful HE, both in terms of damage and fire potential. So really, at the end of the day, this is a ship where you're a lot more likely to do well in if you're a really proficient cruiser captain in spite of the Abruzzi's capabilities and not because of them. In terms of commanders, the Abruzzi offers you a lot of options in terms of what direction you like to go, even if I can't say that it will have a great impact on your overall experience. Looking at the base commander, Campioni, his base trait is called Spartan, which is sort of strange considering the location of Sparta in relationship to, say, Italy, but there's nothing really exceptional about Campioni other than there's nothing too bad about him either. But the thing that intrigued me the most about him was that the Italian cruisers in general, and the Abruzzi in particular, have really good concealment. And if you really want to goose that stat, it's easy to do with Makawa. And if you really want to go all in and push your cruiser's base sea detectability below 8 kilometers, which is pretty crazy, you might even add Svirsky as a second inspiration. The advantage here is simple. You'll be able to get in closer to the enemy and probably get to pounce on him with a few quick salvos of AP, hopefully, or HE if absolutely necessary. Since you're likely faster, that also means that you may be able to run away more effectively, or if you're too brave for that, strategically withdraw at an accelerated pace. It's really the one major advantage I can see with Campioni, but I never did quite make it work in a manner that might warrant the otherwise mediocre skills he offers. When we consider Mimbelli, he does have a lot of ability to make this ship more annoying to your enemy and more survivable. This means more speed, more rudder shift, and a decrease in the damage you're likely to take. This certainly can work, but I'm not sure it's a really worthwhile long-term strategy considering how this ship plays. He also has access to a strangely named perk called I'm Not Insane. And I can honestly say I haven't gotten this high enough to say that he's right because it kind of seems like a poor trade so far. In any case, that will make your torpedo speed more competitive, but it will also make it so you can't stealth fire them. And even then, they're still not really going to be all that fast so I probably wouldn't take it. Ultimately though, what's the point of being alive in this ship if you can't hurt anyone? And finally, we come to Sanzanetti, who I think probably offers the most promise, at least from reading the description of some of these skills, and he still may be the most effective of all these three commanders, 
but probably not because of subtle manipulation. Where San Zanetti is probably the best cruiser captain for this ship has a lot more to do with being able to stack more fire chance into HE shells and to get a little extra penetration out of your relatively low caliber cruiser AP. So basically the normal skills like burn it down and punching through. Subtle manipulation doesn't seem to help this ship very much. It didn't seem to lower the number of over penetrations on cruisers or battleship superstructures that I would score, at least not by very much, or really help in any way with handling destroyers, most of which can actually bounce your relatively low caliber shells. Instead, it mostly seemed to take away from what little chance I had in citadeling an enemy cruiser, and if anything seemed to be more of a disadvantage than a benefit. Maybe this changes at higher level, but the mechanics of this skill don't seem to change all that much, just the bonus to damage. Aegis will help you a little bit in terms of more survivability, though not tremendously, but obviously any little bit can help. The rest of this is pretty standard for right now, hoping to increase DPM and potential fires per minute as much as possible. In terms of stats, it would probably be best to compare this versus the Zara, but since I do not have the Zara and have not played it, I will be talking about the Abruzzi as it falls in terms of its overall placement in tier 6 cruisers. So when we come to the stats of the Abruzzi, she actually fares pretty well on paper for survivability, having a fairly average hit point pool, a fairly average range of armor values, and actually decent torpedo protection for her tier. That said, the Abruzzi can pretty quickly take a lot of damage, as its highest armor values are present in very limited quantities overall. Perhaps every battleship that you can face, with of course the exception of the Sharn Horse, can punch through the front of your armor, and you're extremely susceptible to HE damage from other cruisers and battleships, and being deleted in this ship is not something I'm completely unfamiliar with. The Abruzzi has a strange main battery configuration with one turret with three guns and one turret with two guns, both fore and aft, bringing the ship's total number of guns to 10. You can shoot out to a relatively average 14.5 kilometers and the guns reload every seven and a half seconds. Overall, these are 152 millimeter artillery, which does mean that you will have to time your AP and HE usage pretty well in order to maximize your damage potential. The HE shell damage is lower than average and the 7% fire chance is also not very impressive. Ultimately, this means that your HE damage per minute is about 10% less than other ships, if you score a penetration, which, I'm not gonna lie, will be a bit of a struggle against tier 7 ships. The AP damage is similar to damage of British 152mm guns, though you do not benefit from the improved penetration angles. If you can get your AP working though, the damage per minute the Abruzzi offers is pretty average for cruisers at the tier, and is clearly the better of the two shell types to use for sustained damage output. Luigi does have torpedoes, and they come in the form of one triple launcher on each side. The Abruzzi's torpedoes are interesting because at 51 knots, they're easily the slowest torpedoes at tier 6, and they may actually be the second slowest torpedoes in the overall game. But they do have an incredible 12 kilometer range. Contrary to popular belief, they will actually reach their maximum range before the end of the game, and by that point, with just a 71 second reload, you'll probably be ready to shoot another salvo. If you do manage to hit something, then you're probably a witch, or using these correctly as area denial weapons, shooting them into capture areas where you expect your enemies to congregate. They do have a below average amount of damage with just 13,300, but hey, they can be useful if you want to play this really smart. And at extremely short ranges, the speed of the torpedo isn't all that important. When we look at maneuverability, the Duca degli Abruzzi is a really maneuverable ship and may be, overall, the most maneuverable tier 6 cruiser in the game. In terms of speed, she's 2.3 knots faster than average and loses out only to the shores in terms of overall speed. She's tied with the Miyoko in that category but beats the Miyoko by 100 meters on a turn and the shores by more than 200. So it really is quite fast, and in spite of that speed, actually does have a pretty average turning circle and rudder shift, which is impressive and arguably one of the key strengths of this ship. In terms of concealment, the Abruzzi is straight up the most concealed cruiser at tier six. It beats out the stealth of even the Zara, 
the next closest ship in terms of sea and air detectability. She isn't quite 1.5 kilometers better than average by sea and is a little bit less than one kilometer under the average for air detectability, which is one reason why you might consider a stealthy cruiser build, even if it doesn't really get you anywhere in the end. With consumables, the Abruzzi has two consumables, a sonar and a plane. The sonar I will describe as more or less average for the tier. And you get two of them, which is also pretty standard. With your plane, also standard in terms of its duration and recharge. So there's nothing really to note here other than it could probably use another trick to help make this ship a little bit more interesting or competitive. And now with all that out of the way, we'll jump into some gameplay. We're gonna be on Land of Fire. Uh, here we get going. I was actually not going to show this particular replay at first. I was gonna show you uh, something that is probably a little bit more likely to happen, which was a game where I shot 68 HE shells at distant targets and landed them and got no fires, which I guess is probably a little bit more likely to happen if you do consider buying this ship, but I don't know if everybody's here just to hear me complain about things for 30 minutes, and ultimately I'm not sure if it's apparent. I don't think this is a very competitive ship. I don't think it's a lot of fun to play. There are things that I really like about it in terms of being able to choose your captain and actually have some pretty reasonable choices there. I will go ahead and put my captain up on the screen while we're talking about that, but ultimately you really do struggle to do well in this ship. I found that I can pretty reasonably get 60, 70,000 damage games, but it's it's a lot harder to, to get anything higher than that. And uh, certainly, this isn't my best game, but it is one of my better games. I'm sure some of you who've seen me out there floating around testing out this ship can recount the times when I didn't do so well. I don't usually record those because, of course, I don't think it's it's my job to show you when I transition smoothly between a double McTwist and a face plant. We all have those games. In any case, as we're starting this game out, uh, we've got... We've got a Graf Spee. He's really close to me for a lot of this game. I get a sense that uh, he has a playstyle that is very similar to mine, though he is in a very different ship. I'm sure that means that I would approve of a lot of his choices, except the fact that they get in my way a lot, so you'll have to forgive the both of us for that. In any case, we are opening fire on this Miyoko. You can kind of see I'm trying to stay on the AP. At this sort of distance, you can see the shell grouping is pretty decent in spite of not having a ton of stuff invested into accuracy. The results are a little hit and miss in terms of some salvos are really, really nice with 4,000, 5,000 damage, uh, then a lot of shells are uh, not, not so great, and you end up with a lot of bounces. Uh, you can see we're getting over pens. I am not using, obviously, subtle manipulations. I say it doesn't help a lot, and that's just because of the four or five games I ran with it. I'd still get over pens in this sort of situation. Maybe a couple less, but I'm not sure if it's statistically significant. You can still get quite a few of them, and not being able to Citadel ship is kind of a bummer. Not to say it's impossible, you can you can do it with subtle manipulations, it's just a whole lot more impossible than it needs to be. That doesn't make sense. Anyway, you can see there's a Trento, he's way out there in God's country. Ships in this position are usually ships I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to hunt down. Kind of waffle back and forth on that, I think, in this game. Without going into the play-by-play -play of why he is all the way out there, uh, needless to say, he's not in any immediate threat of, of actually contributing a lot in terms of either damage or map control, so... I am going to drive him off just a little bit more. Mostly that 
right now is due to my presence and the fact that uh, he can probably see me, given that eyeball on the map. In the meantime, I'm just trying to harass this Sharnhorst. I actually drove close to this island thinking that I dropped my spot, and there you have it. Uh, there was unfortunately an airplane. And since the Trento is starting to even out, I'm going to try to put some long range shells out there, see if I can't actually score a couple of decent hits. That's not really all that bad. The thing is, uh, you do have to do a lot of chipping in this type of ship. And obviously, without the advantage of super heavy AP or some other things that might exist on the PC, this can take a long time. And at this sort of range, it's it's not a thing that I'm too interested in. I'm turning in here because the guy's actually shooting at me and I prefer to keep all of my hit points for as long as possible. He's smoking up, which makes me really want to leave him alone, but you can also see he's got the attention of our Sharn Horse friend over there. So I'm going to maybe suggest that the Sharn Horse move away, and I'll go chase him down because it just makes a little bit more sense since I'm faster for me to be the one who wastes his time finishing this guy off if we absolutely need to do that. There you can see me investigating the possibility of launching a widespread at somebody who's about 75 miles away from me. Not recommended. They'll be just a little bit too easy to dodge. Even if the dude sits in that smoke screen the entire time. And there's our Sharn Horse friend, of course. He's heading out there. I really don't want him to waste his time, so... Again, discourage him from doing that. Of course, he finishes him off, so... Uh, what do I know? In any case, you can see we are even on ships at this point. We are down on caps, though we are making a pretty good push in terms of trying to get B back. There is our friend, the Graf Spee, right in front of us. And as we're coming through this gap, a York pops out. York's a nice thing that I would love to shoot at. I think he's going to start moving forward, which is why uh, I put those so far out in front of him. Uh, unfortunately, might have thought he was slowing down a little bit quicker than that. You get a nice big salvo in there at the end, scoring two citadels. Uh, citadel eh, doesn't really happen on battleships, which is why you may notice that I'm aiming right about at deck level. Uh, that way, if my shells are a little low, I should hit upper belt, which I'm pretty sure I can pen, uh, particularly on a Sharnhorst. If they're high, they'll hit superstructure, in which case I should be able to pen that as well. We do come away with some pretty respectable salvos off of the Sharnhorst. Uh, as we're turning around and we see this Trento, you can see I'm aiming my 152s too much at his hull, and even that very lightly armored Italian cruiser can bounce these shells off the side. 
If I want to keep using the AP, I do have to aim superstructure. That's kind of a tricky task sometimes, particularly if they're maneuvering or at any range that's greater than this. Uh, but really, I should probably be switching over to HE against this target, even if the HE is depressing. Our team has done a pretty good job of clawing back B, and in fact, at this point, it looks like we're probably going to sail on to a victory. In the middle of that melee, we did demonstrate how the AP on the Abruzzi can actually do a pretty decent amount of damage. Uh, it's helped a lot by the fact I haven't taken any shots. Uh, certainly at the beginning of the game, that was helped by good placement behind islands. But against the Scharnhorst and the Trento, I just got lucky that they didn't shoot me because I definitely offered them a nice target that they could very easily take advantage of. We also did a pretty decent job predicting with our torpedoes. Uh, and that's really just close range to the speed of the torpedoes. Not that important. This gentleman does not look like he is about to shoot at me either. And even though this is basically just uh, free damage, it's damage apparently that we need to do in order to, to hasten this towards victory. Now, if we look at the positioning of everything, I'm moving over to A because as a fast cruiser, this is a strength of the Abruzzi. Uh, you can get around the battlefield pretty much faster than any other cruiser in the game. And as we hit our top speed over 35 knots with the speed flag, pretty competitive with some of the slower destroyers in the game. So an asset to your team if you can keep yourself in the game. You know, try to capture all the bases. Um, strangely, we're going to end up contributing only to the capture of the base that was furthest from where we started. Now, I don't think that this particular destroyer is going to sink all four ships remaining on my team, but a minute ago we had five, so he's moving in the right direction. After we get this capture taken care of, we are going to go try to join the hunt. Having our sonar is going to help uh, make it a little bit less dangerous, and maybe we can spot that destroyer in a smoke screen if we need to, but uh, this is all pretty standard cruiser stuff, so not really all that special when it comes to the Abruzzi. Now we're just taking a guess here. If I were the destroyer and I were the last person on the team, I would either go for C, in which case I have very little chance of catching up with him in any short-term scenario, but he'd also be giving up the game. Or I would circle back into B, seeing that the other now three ships on the enemy team are, as far as I can tell, all to the south. And maybe I can get B uncontested. I also have a bailout route into C between those two larger islands on the east side. And I'm going to guess, since he's already sunk two of our ships, that this guy's a fighter. So right now I'm just going to make best speed towards B. Uh, with the option of going through that gap into C. I will mention, as I'm spotted here, under normal circumstances, I would have HE loaded. I was curious to see how this AP performed versus destroyers. There you can see... We get a couple pens, we get several over pens, and we get several more bounces, which uh, is unfortunate considering the role that these were originally intended for. Uh, in any case, we managed to finish off the game. We do 82,000 damage. It helps a lot that a lot of that was people not fighting back and people not targeting me. But the Abruzzi, a little disappointing uh, in terms of overall for a cruiser, without a heal, without a smoke screen without something to make it a little bit different. She does feel like she measures short versus some of the other offerings in the game. Yeah, she does have nice speed, great sea detectability, but she's so insufficient in terms of firepower that when you get the jump on your enemy and it still doesn't matter, it's just kind of disappointing. 
Uh, in any case, I hope you have enjoyed this little review. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>